certainly is good to see everybody. If you're, again, if you're visiting with us or if you're following us on YouTube, we want to invite you to be with us anytime in, in the area. And it's always a privilege for me to share in God's Word with you. Uh, well, certainly we know today is Labor Day Eve. Uh, you know, Labor Day, it never really made much sense to me as a kid. I just couldn't wrap my mind around if it was a day of labor, why weren't people working? But uh, I finally learned and figured out what the deal was, that it was uh, uh, certainly a day that you took off from your labors. Wikipedia, if you look it up, says this about Labor Day. It says, Labor Day in the United States is a public holiday celebrated on the first Monday in September. It honors the American labor movement and the contributions that workers have made to the strength, prosperity, law, and well-being of the country. It is the Monday of the long weekend known as Labor Day weekend and is considered the unofficial end of summer in the United States. It is recognized as a federal holiday. Well, that's been ever since 1894 when Grover Cleveland proclaimed the first Monday in September as Labor Day. And uh, as it was first recognized, labor unions and their commitment of the American worker. And throughout the years, it's evolved really now to nothing more than a day off from work. I do think probably in the big cities, you still, they probably still have some Labor Day parades where the uh, different union trades are represented and put in floats like we would see for civic organizations here. So uh, in the bigger cities where unions are more prevalent. But uh, really there's no, no, in this area especially, no special emphasis done on that. But it has evolved now into a weekend when college football kicks off. We know that much for sure. And uh, we know that it's kind of the last taste of, of summer. I know I had to go up to Lexington Friday and I was amazed. It seemed like every other vehicle was an Ohio uh, boat coming south. So I figured, well, Lake Cumberland's going to be crammed this weekend. So uh, last little taste of summer. And a lot of schools up north will start uh, after the holiday weekend. So uh, they start a little later than us. So Labor Day means a lot of different things. And we think about labor and work here in the United States. 40-hour work week for most. Sometimes it's 50 or 60 hours. Uh, certainly uh, we put our time in. But you may or may not remember a Time Magazine article back in the 60s. And I got kind of tickled when I read this. It said that expert testimony was given to a Senate subcommittee on time management. And they predicted that advances in technology would radically change how many hours a week people worked. They forecasted that the average American would be working 22 hours a week within 20 years. That would have been the 80s. Okay? The great challenge, the experts said, would be figuring out what to do with all the excess time. So now you think about that. How, much, how many of you sit and worry about all the excess spare time that you have? Not me. Oh, Glenn. Well, we'll see if we can't fix that for you. One man out of 65, okay, that has too much time on his hands. We can all envy him for sure. Uh, they were wrong, though, for most. And then when we think about that, uh, it would be okay if we did work about 20, 22 hours a week. We could get much more rest, couldn't we? Because that's what a lot of us, uh, I've even asked a few this morning, what are you going to do Labor Day? Uh, rest is what I'm going to do. Uh, someone said whatever Donna tells me to do. So I'm not sure that he has all that much spare time to do anyway. Uh, but uh, certainly when we think about uh, Labor Day, we think about kind of a day of rest. Uh, the Bible says a lot about rest. The Jewish people, if we think about it, remember they were constantly in search or seeking rest and refuge in God. And in Joshua chapter 1, after Moses had died, and God told Joshua to lead the Jewish nation across the Jordan uh, into the promised land, we're going to look at how this promised land is defined before we get started into the substance of our sermon this morning. Joshua chapter 1, 13 through 15 should be up on the board. It says, uh, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. 
Your wives, your little ones, your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord hath given your brethren rest as he hath given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then you shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of Jordan toward the, the sunrise. So rest referred there several times. And only true rest can come through and from God. And that's one of the, the prevailing themes throughout uh, the Old Testament. But not even there. Hebrews chapter 4, if you want to turn way over uh, to the other side of your Bible, Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 says this, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of, e of a eternity into his rest, any of you should see to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So therefore, uh, we see only those who believe can truly experience and see this rest. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 11. And this is where our base scripture is coming from in this morning's sermon about something that Jesus tells us about rest. And that's what I want to look at briefly here and that how that we can, can seek out and, and have that same rest as well for ourselves. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 29, and 30, uh, a very popular scripture uh, for us. We, we should all know this. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that are labor, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden light. And Jesus here, as I said, he tells us three things that we need to do. And that's what I... I want to look at this morning. I want to remind us as believers what Jesus calls us here to do, but I also want to equip us and maybe those that are here this morning without a relationship with Christ that if you're seeking rest, the only true rest you're going to have is through Jesus Christ, provided by God. And here we have the keys to this, as Jesus tells us. And the first one being in verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me. And that's the first thing. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Notice what Jesus didn't say there. Jesus didn't say, come to church, and I will give you rest. Because rest comes from true salvation. Rest comes when you meet and know Jesus personally. Just being a member of a church doesn't make you a Christian. Church membership without a personal relationship makes you a hypocrite, is what it does. So just being associated with the church, and I'll give you a little example uh, for myself. Before I switched positions at the bus garage, I would go each and every day, uh, most each and every day, probably 29 days out of 30, I would be at Philpot Tire at lunch, eating my lunch there. And it was a funny thing because I did this over the course of about three years. And the, the uniforms that the guys wore at the tire shop was the exact uniforms that we had at the bus garage except for one tag. Okay. Well, being there every day, about the same time every day, Mike and a friend of mine there, Charlie, kept telling me, you know, we had another person asking about the guy that works for us that stands over there and eats lunch all the time. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding. I said, who were they talking about? They said, talking about you, dummy. They said, well, I didn't show up for a couple of days in a row. And, and another customer walked in and asked if I was sick because they hadn't seen me there a couple of days. Was concerned that I'd gotten fired even, maybe. And my point is this. I was there every day. People saw me there every day. But that didn't make me an employee of Philpot Tire. Sometimes 
I would feel bad because they would come in and look to me and they would think I was working there and I'm thinking, well, am I going to hurt his business if I don't talk? And I would start talking to people, okay? They'd ask me a question. So I would answer the questions that I could. And if I couldn't ask, answer the question, I would say, let me go get someone to help you. But that still didn't make me an employee, even though I was dressed like they were. And I was even treating people like I was an employee of Philpott Tire. I was just a loafer. Okay? And I admitted it. People would ask me, what are you doing up here? I'm loafing. He don't charge me to come here. I'm going to stay until he tells me not to come back. But that didn't make me an employee. Neither does coming to church make you an employee or a, a Christian. Neither does looking up a lot of information and knowing a lot about Jesus make you a Christian. Or joining groups make you a Christian. What makes a person a Christian is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When you enter into that relationship by accepting him as your Savior, then you become a Christian. So there's a lot of things that we can do on the outside that makes us look like, a, like we belong there. But until we have that deep personal relationship with Christ, we're not a Christian. And that's what Jesus is inviting us in this very first scripture. The very first words he says, come unto me. Come unto me, he says. He's in uh, that invitation. Come unto me, I will provide rest. That rest that you're searching for. And it's an indescribable rest. It's an indescribable peace when we come to Jesus. So certainly, that's the first step. Next, Jesus says something else in verse 28, our second point. What does he say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What's the point? I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Jesus is saying that he'll carry that burden for you. Let me carry those burdens that are on your back, making you tired and weary. Now, we can imagine this, can't we? If you see someone, uh, a family member, a friend, your, your wife, your husband, carrying something, got uh, too much on them to bear, what do, you, what do you normally do? Here, let me help you with those. Let me get those bags. Let me get this box for you. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You're carrying a burden that's far too heavy for you to carry. Give it to me. I'll carry it for you. Now, we've studied in the past. We remember that the Jewish law and man's law had 613 some odd laws that they had to try to, try to follow for salvation and to be acceptable before the Lord. And there is no way that any one person or any two people, for that fact, could keep all those laws. The burden of that was upon those people as well. The yoke as Jesus refers that to. So these people were, they were despondent, downtrodden. They were seeking rest from all this man-made religion that they were trying their best out there, trying their best to keep these 613 some odd laws, making sure they didn't walk too far on a certain day, making sure they didn't eat certain things, making sure they didn't touch certain things, and so many different things that it was impossible to stay in the right relationship. And Jesus is saying, if you're tired of trying to please all these man-made rules and regulations, let me carry that burden of sin for you. Let me carry that shame for you. Come to me. I'll give you rest. I'll take that load off of you. Now ask yourself these two questions. And I want you to really think about it when you do. Am I good enough to have eternal life on my own? No, I'm not. Has my good deeds outweighed my bad deeds so much that I can go to heaven without Christ? No. Jesus says this, let me carry those burdens for you. Let me make you good enough. Let me take your place for the sin, the punishment. And even though try as we might, sometimes we forget that we are saved by grace, not by works. As Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, you'll recall. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and 
that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We try to place rules and regulations on ourselves in order to be saved. All God places on us is Christ. He says, I'll carry your burden for you. Aren't you tired of trying to be good enough? Let me carry the load. Come unto me and find rest for your souls, he says. I'll carry the burden of salvation. And then lastly, in verses 29 and 30, Jesus says this. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What's Jesus saying here? Commit yourself to me. Commit yourself to the things that I'm teaching, that my disciples are teaching. Now, we know in this part of the country we have the, the, the familiarity with what a yoke is. Not too many years ago, it wouldn't have been uncommon to see a yoke of whatever two animals you were working. And probably in some of your barns, you may still have a yoke hanging in your barns from those times go past. But it's, it's made of wood, and it's uh, fit to particular to the, the shoulders of the animal that it was for, and it's used to control the animals. Now you see that reference, how the yoke, the reference that Jesus is saying, the yoke of the 613, yoke of the man, yoke of the world, submission to the world. Being under a yoke of a particular teacher or particular philosopher, that yoke picture continues to get in our mind. Jesus is saying, commit to my yoke. Come under my yoke, he says. Commit to my teachings because of why. What does he say? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now you think about the, the yoke of the world and the yoke of of. Uh, the Jewish law, that wasn't easy. It was a heavy burden, wasn't it? Jesus is saying, what I expect from you is different from what you've been taught. Your eternal destiny, he's saying, is no longer determined by works, by rules, by regulations. Because under the old Levitical law, that's exactly what they had to do. They had to, that's why they had to drag a, a goat or a cow or a turtle dove or a pigeon to the, to, uh, to the temple for sacrifice for sin every year. That was the whole thing. Christ says, my yoke is easy. My yoke is light. And guess what Jesus' yoke was? Turn over to Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Here's the yoke of Jesus. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of what? The law and the prophets. That's what we were just talking about, the 613 that was so heavy and burdensome on people. Jesus says, I'm going to reduce that down to two. And think about this mind picture. When you look at a yoke, how many, how many animals does it hold? Two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's so the two things that Jesus' yoke holds. That's the two things that Jesus requires. And it's not something new because when you look at the law, when, Jesus, when God made the law and handed it down, that's what it was all about anyway, was two. It's always been two. Because of man's hard-heartedness and because of man's hard-headedness, he had to expand on the two to get down specific in things. And we know that, don't we? Really good, especially for kids, if you don't specifically tell them sometimes to do something, they don't do exactly what you want them to do. And then you go back to them and say, well, why didn't you do such and such? Well, you didn't say to do such and such. 
specifics. That's what the law was about. Love God, love each other. That's his two commandments. If your soul isn't able to rest, there's no way you can find physical rest. So I'll close this morning with a little definition from the rest, as you will find in the dictionary, and how they parallel what Jesus is talking about. Rest, a cessation from action, motion, labor, or exertion. So to enter into God's rest is to cease from all efforts of self-help in order to earn salvation. Rest. Freedom from that which wearies or disturbs. God gives us rest. Freedom from the cares and the burdens that robs us of that peace and that rest. Rest. Something that is fixed and settled. God's rest gives us assurance that our salvation is settled. Christians have that assurance of eternity. It's fixed. It's settled. It's settled through and by and because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> nothing that I could do, nothing that peril can do, changes that. The Bible tells us, Jesus says, come unto me, those of you who are heavy laden, and labor, and I will give you rest. And he goes on to say that my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And that's what he's calling for all of us. And as Christians, sometimes we get wrapped up into things, and we want to take that burden back that we give to Jesus so many years ago. But that was never the intent. When Jesus takes the burden, he intends to keep the burden. And for some of us maybe sitting here this morning, we've never given that, that burden over to Jesus. We still want to carry that around with us and lug that around and not be at rest, not be at peace, always at turmoil inside, but never giving over to God, never giving over to Jesus the burdens that we carry, that sin that, that so plagues us. And that's all that Jesus is saying is, come unto me. I'll carry that for you. You don't have to be weighed down anymore. And that's what we offer this morning in this invitation. Only trust him. I think it's number 200. We're going to sing the first and second verse of this hymn. Only trust Jesus. Will you give your burdens over to him today? Have you heard and believed? Are you willing to repent of your sins and confess Christ as your Savior? Be buried with him in baptism? Raise that new creation and go faithful following the steps of Jesus until either he returns or we're called away in death? Maybe you're a Christian and you realize, you know what, I put myself back under a yoke and I'm going to give it back to Jesus because I don't like the way it feels. In either case, we're going to sing the first and second verse of this hymn. Would you please come if you have a decision to make as we stand and sing.